There have been many Ruby rewrites releasing lately that overhaul significant aspects of the show, like getting rid of the Maidens, the Relics, Salem, completely altering character arcs, changing Ozpin's host, redoing the world building of the kingdoms or organizations like the White Fang from the ground up. And I don't have a problem with people doing any of this. Obviously, they're not my rewrite, so it's none of my business, but it did make me think to myself, what single change could I make to Ruby that addresses the most amount of criticism? That is to say, how can I improve multiple aspects of the show via the butterfly effect while only seeking to actually change one thing? Whereas other rewrites intentionally change many things, I wanted to see what would happen if I only seek to change one thing and the domino effect that I think would arise from that change, and if one single change could cover a lot of people's most recent criticisms. Good day, everybody. It is Kelaxon here with another Ruby rewrite. If you enjoy this video, please check out the Patreon to help support content like this, maybe even allow us to make them more ambitious, like being able to use custom assets and art, since right now I'm doing everything myself, and I do see a lot of other rewrites doing that, and I wish I could do it. There is going to be some puppet theater, as was with the Cinder rewrite, but it is just me, myself, and I, so let's get into it. So similar to my Cinder rewrite, I did write a list of goals that I want to accomplish here. Number one is make Team Ruby more proactive. A lot of recent criticism of the show is that Team Ruby has to wait around for things to happen, such as needing to travel to the academies and just wait around for them to be attacked. Since they are protecting the relics or the maidens, they are always on the defensive instead of being able to be offensive. Number two is to allow Team Ruby to be the main heroes, especially in the most recent volumes, with Volume 9 being the exception. Older characters in higher positions of authority keep taking the glory away from Team Ruby. To loosely quote Judgmental Critter about this, because I think she made a really good point, Ruby stays upstairs dealing with Emerald and Mercury while Raven and Cinder get to do plot downstairs in the vault. In that same vein, Winter and Penny get to protect the Maidens while Team Ruby is off fighting the Aesops or other lesser antagonists. A lot of people feel as though Team Ruby has been shafted as the ones that get to be the heroes lately. And number three, as always, to entertain myself, because why else are we here if we're not trying to have fun? And hopefully create a concept that you guys are excited to engage with, because I think it's really fun and really cool. And this concept is as simple as, what if Salem and Ozpin's roles were reversed? This is the only intentional change that I'm going to be making, and from my perspective, everything else is the result of this one change being brought on by the butterfly effect. Or in other words, I had to change things in order to account for this now being the case, and I needed to write new scenarios in order to account for fixing things that switching their roles may cause. Ruby Volume 1. Our rewrite starts with Ruby confronting Roman during the dust shop robbery as she did in canon. But instead of Glinda saving Ruby, it is Cinder, where the mysterious driver of Roman's getaway vehicle, you may be able to guess, but for now, is a mystery. This is where we tackle our first major changes. It is not Ozpin who lets Ruby into Beacon, but instead, it is Salem via a hologram. Other than Salem being the headmistress of Beacon, Cinder, Mercury, and Emerald are recently graduated hunters, and for narrative purposes for some scenes, will replace Port and Ublek. Port and Ublek are still teachers but this is so Cinder can build more connections to Team Ruby as teachers, assistants who still are around their age divorced from the stern authority figures, and this will be important for later on. Much like the show, we'll find out later that Cinder, Emerald, and Mercury all come from less than ideal circumstances, and Salem, like a fairy godmother, rescued them and gave them a place at the academy. But getting back to Ruby, Salem is not there in person, and the technology being utilized here would give the implication to the audience that she's based on the Wizard of Oz. She makes a warm, yet in hindsight, eerie comment about Ruby having silver eyes. The fourth edition of Cinder's team will be Trivia, aka Neo. Cinder's team escorts the students on training missions, and during key conversations such as Weiss and Port talking on the balcony, they will replace the teacher characters. This gives them a stronger bond with Team Ruby, Coffee, and Juniper, as I already mentioned, and will help to set up future parallels. Since this video is a broad pitch versus an episode-by-episode -episode rewrite, even though I have beef with other aspects of Volume 1, we're only really gonna focus on what's necessary and like I said, we're only changing one thing, and stuff like the White Fang or Jean's screen time distribution is not impacted by the Salem swap ultimately, so it doesn't really count. But because Cinder's role has changed, she's not the one who recruited Roman and the White Fang, and we'll talk about that later. The only thing I'll justify changing, though, is that instead of Team Sun being involved in Blake's arc, it's gonna be Team Coffee. It doesn't have to do with me liking Team Coffee more or Team Coffee bias. Specifically, it's going to be Velvet who gives Blake a place to stay when she's fighting with her team and talks to her about her backstory. Moving on to Volume 2, instead of Sun and Neptune being the ones to help Team Ruby with their investigation, it's going to be Team Coffee, but Torchwick still gets away with
with Neo's help. Our first major change comes at the Beacon Dance, where Torchwick and Neo will break into the school and plant the virus instead of Cinder. Instead of Ruby seeing Cinder, she sees Neo and recognizes Neo from the mech fight with Torchwick. This prompts Ruby to mention what Roman said about the Southeast when Glinda slash Ironwood slash Salem, because Salem is the headmistress now, asks her if she remembers anything particularly. In regards to the dynamic with Salem and Ironwood versus Ozpin and Ironwood, I don't think that it would be too different, though the dialogue I think would be different. The premise would still say the same. The sentiment of Ironwood's behavior would still remain, and even on Salem's end, this idea of sending in the flag bearers or the scouts would still be something I feel like is in character for her to say. So the essence of the scene will remain the same to get us on the same track, but I do see the dialogue and the dynamics being different just because Salem is a different person. In a live broadcast situation, I do suspect that the audience would start to catch on to the fact that Trivia and Neo are potentially the same person, but this isn't really too different from knowing that Cinder, Mercury, and Emerald are evil at the end of Volume 1 and then having them be students at the school. The only thing that would come into question is whether or not Cinder, Mercury, and Emerald are in on it with Neo slash Trivia, or if it's just her and the three of them don't know, so that is pretty spicy. And at least with Neo and Trivia, at least Neo's school disguise is completely different. Mount and Glenn would have the same function, but I want Cinder's team to be here instead of Ooblack. Instead of Mercury and Emerald pretending to arrest Roman, Trivia does. Roman is captured and put into Ironwood's prison, and there are other parts of Volume 2 that could use slight adjustments, but that's the... <laughs> Ruby Volume 3. As far as the Vital Festival is concerned, Trivia would be the one rigging people against each other and meddling in the Vital Festival, and that's part of hacking the CCT. Crow and Winter's attendance would still be relevant, but the Crow Intel meeting will function a little bit differently. Crow explains an attack on the Academy is coming and that the infiltrators are already here, to which Ironwood says no shit, similarly to how he does in the show, but Crow puts forth that they start to train Ruby as their guardian. The argument about an army versus a symbol stays intact, and Crow explains that the reason why he's shown up is because he believes it's time to tell Ruby the truth. Salem's behavior seems a bit odd compared to usual, but ultimately she gives Crow permission to train Ruby. So we get a nice parallel of Winter training Weiss to use the summons and Crow training Ruby. Crow wouldn't actually mention the Silver Eyes because I still think it's important to keep it a secret as the show intended to keep them a secret up until volume three, but we would get some meditation and a similar conversation with Maria, but not mentioning the Silver Eyes. So talks of think about love and lessen your emotions when you're around the Grim and focus on protecting people. And the idea would be in the novels, there's this mention of meditation techniques that you can calm your own emotions down so the Grim don't sense you. So Crow would teach Ruby those techniques almost in disguise. Like, think about this when the Grim are attacking, and it would serve to calm her emotions down, but also serve to trigger her silver eyes. Now that we more or less reach the flashback portion, this is where we get a huge change. First, we see Salem recruiting Cinder from the hotel in Atlas, Post Rhodes, and then Cinder recruiting Mercury and Emerald, similar to the show. Months before Volume 1, we see Cinder's team was sent on a mission. We see them fight and kill someone, and they take the Relic of Knowledge. They successfully bring it to the school, and we discover the true nature nature of the academies. Salem built the academies and the four vaults in order to protect the relics scattered across Remnant once she located them. Finding the relics is difficult, but actually getting them out of where the God of Light put them is almost suicidal, so it hasn't been done up until this point for that reason. They are almost impossible to find, and even if you found them, there are very difficult trials. Because the Grim are faintly attracted to the relic, Salem has made her own version of the Maidens, not as keys to the vault, but rather more like bloodhounds. And for the purpose of our rewrite, I'm gonna call them witches. I think that that's fun. There used to be a theory that there were four witches equivalent to the maidens, and I think that that's an interesting concept to bring back for this specific rewrite. Witches can open the vaults since they share the same magic as Salem, but that isn't their purpose since there's nothing in the vaults right now anyway. Cinder is the first witch created when Salem got wind of the rumors that one of the relics was uncovered. Now knowing the locations of the other relics, she wants to create three more. As I already mentioned, the reason why why Salem has not done this in the past is because the Grim are only faintly attracted to the relic, and so it would be 
like sending people to find needles and haystacks. Sending witches out into the world just to find the relics would be ridiculous and it would take too long and then those people would die and she would have to make new maidens. So she's wanted to maintain her magic levels and so she hasn't done it yet. But now that they actually know the vague locations of where they are, she wants to send out more witches. And this is when we would also see, I'm assuming up until this point, Cinder would have gloves like Cinderella long gloves on her outfit and we would see that underneath one of the gloves is her grim arm and that could be foreshadowed up until this point. So that is not going to be a post volume three thing, but rather part of this witch modification. Salem has a short list of choices for who she wants the other maidens to be. And these are Pyrrha, Velvet, and Weiss. My justification for this is even though she has Cinder's team, they can't be in multiple places at once and she wants to send them all out to find the relic. And it'll also be more discreet if it's people that she has less of a connection to. Like they're just her students instead of Cinder's team, which is like her personal Aesops. So she's trying to pick teams that it wouldn't be too alarming if they go to Atlas, Mistral, or Vacuo. She picks Pyrrha because Pyrrha is Mistral's champion who will fight to find the relic in Mistral. Weiss in hopes she can easily be controlled by Ironwood and Atlas and be told what to do and it wouldn't be out of place for Weiss to eventually return home with her team. And Velvet because she is unassuming yet strong and she wishes to send Team Coffee to Vacuo. So you kind of see what Salem is doing here. It wouldn't be out of place to send Team Juniper to Mistral on their school break after the Vital Festival because that's where Pyrrha is from and Jean's family is from there too. Wouldn't be out of place for Weiss to go home for holiday break and if she just happens to go looking for a relic, you know? And in terms of Vacuo, I almost changed Fox into a woman. I think that Velvet is justifiable, especially since she'll have a greater role in the story, but that's a whole other situation. So even though we changed the conversation about the Guardian to be Ruby instead of Pyrrha, this is where we'll start to get the scenes that mirror the Pyrrha being chosen for the maiden part in the show. Salem needs to be stealthy. She can't let her enemies know about her plans, which is why she wants to send out newer students outside of her inner circle, but ones who will still be loyal to her. Because from Salem's perspective, her enemies imagine that she will pick an elite huntsman or huntress, someone like Winter or Rumpel or Glinda, someone who's in her inner circle and has a lot of training and experience. And that's why she wants to send Team Ruby, Team Juniper, and Team Coffee. And particularly, she wants to send Team Juniper away first after the Vital Festival because it'll be school break and it won't be weird for them to go home. Whereas with Weiss, there may need to be some clearance. And so her plan is basically Pyrrha, Velvet, and then Weiss to be last. And Salem's idea is that once there, Pyrrha can use the witch powers to locate the relic and her and Team Juniper can complete the trial. As I already mentioned, another important attribute of the God of Light's ruins, if you want to call them that, is that there is a deadly trial related to the relic's powers. And Pyrrha is one of the greatest warriors of their generation, so of course Salem would trust her to be able to complete it. What I mean by that is there is a destruction-based trial, a creation-based trial, a knowledge-based trial, which has already been completed by, again, Miss woman <laughs> that was murdered by Cinder and then a choice-based trial. Back to the Vital Festival because Penny hasn't died yet and she needs to. Penny is hacked during the tournament. This change has to be made because Emerald cannot make Pyrrha hallucinate anymore and this is also foreshadowed as a possibility with Roman and Neo hacking into the CCT. Neo has still rigged the tournament for Penny to be exposed by Pyrrha as a robot and we get this scene where Ruby has to be held back by Yang because she's not being bullied by Mercury so she's held back by Yang and the other students as they have no choice but to fight and kill Penny. The fall of Beacon begins with a man's mysterious message to the world about how the academies, huntsmen, and headmasters and headmistresses are not what they seem. The Atlas robots begin attacking, the White Fang drops in, and Roman escapes custody with Neo's help. Much like Volume 3, these students are fighting back against the Grimm and the robots. The White Fang and Adam have their confrontation with Blake and Yang. Ironwood and Winter try to reclaim Ironwood's ship. And Pyrrha goes off to be witchified with Cinder, Mercury, and Emerald serving as added protection. And my thought process in terms of the themes here, if we want to talk about that, is obviously Cinder is Cinderella, and this was part of her Cinderella transformation. So the witchification is like a twisted fairy tale coming of age metaphor. Cinder, this was her wish. She wanted to have power, and for Pyrrha, she is now having her wish granted, just like Cinder did, and it's this twisted kinship almost between the both of them. Salem as the ultimate fairy godmother who's making people 
people's wishes come true through grimifying them. Ruby still goes after Torchwick, but Roman does not die by the Grim here. Roman and Neo aren't actually trying to kill Ruby, they didn't expect to see her here, but they're actually trying to subdue her and reason with her, which seems odd. We get the reveal that Trivia is Neo, and Ruby asks why Trivia would pretend to be a huntress only to turn against the school. Crow finally arrives on the scene, telling Ruby to come with him, but when Crow isn't actively fighting against Torchwick and Neo, and they almost seem relieved to see him, Ruby calls him out. It starts to get a little suspicious. Crow tries to cover it up through referencing the conversation that they have in Volume 3. If you guys remember, they have this conversation where Crow is like, yeah, stopping Torchwick was kind of meaningless and petty and didn't really matter, guys. You didn't stop all the crime in Vale, and he has dialogue like that. So there is a reference to that. Crow's like, oh, remember what I said? Like, they don't matter right now. But Ruby also starts to wonder, like, how did you know that I was here? So the jig is up, and eventually they get Ruby under control, and Ruby has no choice but to go with them, Crow promising that he'll explain everything. But right now, she just has to cooperate. And what Neo does is she transforms Ruby to look like Trivia using her semblance. Crow and Glinda take Ruby, looking like Trivia, into the vault. And the reason why this doesn't set off any alarms is because Trivia is part of Cinder's team. Roman and Neo are also there, but they're disguised into the wall, similar to what Neo does in Monstra in Volume 8. Pyrrha is being witchified by Salem. Ruby almost talks, startled to see Pyrrha there, and nearly gives it all away. When everyone's in position, Crow gives a signal, and all hell breaks loose. Cinder, Mercury, and Emerald are fighting Crow and Glinda. Salem is still in the process of using her magic on Pyrrha, and they can't be separated at the moment. Neo and Roman expose themselves to Clock Jean and then give Crow and Glinda their support. Crow shouts for her, Ruby, to think about what they talked about before, and this is when Ruby will use her silver eyes. Salem evaporates temporarily, similar to what Ozpin does to her in Volume 8. Cinder gets hurt, but survives and retreats, but by using the silver eyes, Ruby accidentally kills Pyrrha, whose grim parts have not fully grafted onto her human parts yet in the same way that Cinder's did. Ruby, realizing what she's done after using her new powers, passes out. The vault, which looks like it's almost made out of Grimm itself, opens. We now get a speech from Ozpin that overlays instead of Salem's speech. Jean is alone, Yang's arm has been cut off, Ruby is unconscious, Weiss is arguing with Winter and Ironwood, refusing to leave Ruby alone. Velvet is trying to comfort Blake, and Team Ruby is not going to be split up after Volume 3. Crow continues to play the loving uncle and escorts Team Ruby back to Patch, and we see this very tiny relic of knowledge attached to his necklace hidden underneath his shirt, so we see it glowing underneath the gray. And at this point, I feel like the audience would be like, even you guys may be like, if you can't see where this is going, you guys may be like, what the fuck is Crow evil? Is that why Crow said trying to stop crime was useless in the conversation with Yang? Was he bad? Like, is he working with the bad guys? Did Ruby really kill Piro? Now we have Ruby waking up at Patch. When I walks in, Ruby is relieved to see him, but when Crow walks in, everything comes flooding back to her. Where's Pyrrha? Why are they all here? Why aren't their scrolls working? Why was Crow working with Roman? There's arguing, there's screaming, there's shouting, things have been thrown, vases with flowers have been tossed, and this is where we are going to finally meet Ozpin, with Glinda by his side. Crow explains they never meant for Pyrrha to die, and that they didn't know that Salem was going to make another one of those things. This does little to comfort anyone, but there is one question left in the Relic of Knowledge. Salem and Ozpin have both asked the Relic for the other Relic locations, and so now he uses the final question to have Jin show Team Ruby the truth. And this is it, guys. This is what you've been waiting for for 30 minutes of the video. I'm not entirely sure how long it's going to be to get us to this point, but it was important. We had to lay the foundation, and so now here is the reward. Salem has been building up the kingdoms and the academies for hundreds of years in order to have her own army of huntsmen ready to protect the Relics for when she finds them, making it harder for Ozpin to intervene. She wants to bring the relics together, call back the gods, and destroy the world to break her curse. Instead of Salem hiding in the shadows, Salem has done this by pretending to fight for humanity in the light. Because their roles have been swapped, Ozpin is the one who's been fighting from the shadows. Using magic and other things to glamour her appearance, she has taken many forms. The Queen of Vale, for example, the Headmistress of Beacon, and so on and so forth. In this reveal, we find out that the vaults have a weakness. They can be deactivated by the Silver-Eyed Warriors, because every part of Salem's magic is influenced by the grim part of herself. The vaults are like living, breathing grim cages of the dark pool matter. Ozpin has been planning the 
the attack on the school for a long time in order to cut off global communication and try to get the huntsmen of the other schools to turn against Salem. But when Crow, through his spying, finds out that Salem actually found a relic that Cinder, Emerald, and Mercury, and Trivia brought one back to her, they decided that they needed to strike now, that their plans were all moved up. They are hoping that without Salem's constant influence and manipulation, they can flip the remaining schools against her. They're also hoping that Salem did not reveal to anyone where the other relics are yet since she uses the headmasters but doesn't necessarily trust them. She always has her own hand-chosen unit like Cinder's team, just like Crow, Raven, and Summer once were. People who are easier to manipulate and control because they feel indebted to her in some way. Salem knows that she is weakened by the Silver-Eyed Warriors, which is why she had them all exterminated. And without the fear of the Grimm, the people of the kingdoms wouldn't be as easy to control. She needs the Grimm to remain a threat so she can provide protection. She built the academies promising the kingdoms that she would protect them. And so if they don't need her protection anymore, what would she have? The reason she accepts Ruby two years early and gives her special treatment was actually in an attempt to get her killed. She hopes by sending Ruby to Mountain Glen, Roman would take care of the problem without Salem having to lift a finger. She hadn't realized that Roman was actually working for Ozpin, but otherwise Salem has done this before, bringing Silver-Eyed Warriors into the fray to be on her side so she can more easily make sure they don't turn against her and later either experimenting on them in secret or killing them. And this is what happened to Summer. This also draws a nice parallel with Ruby and Little Red Riding Hood. Ruby goes into the woods and the wolf was after her the entire time. I think you would notice in hindsight in this rewrite, if you went back and looked at Mount and Glen, that the Grimm are being extra aggro toward Ruby because they are trying to kill Ruby. It's almost a Snow White and the Huntsman situation too. Osman has no way of proving what he says is true. Even with the relic, how can they be sure that the relic is obligated to tell them the truth? How do they know it's not a hallucination or some sort of technology? What if it's part of Neo semblance? Even with Ty and Crow vouching for Ozpin, we have to remember that from the perspective of Team Ruby, Pyrrha and Penny are dead, Yang's arm was cut off, they're working with the White Fang. It's hard to believe given the company Ozpin is keeping, like the White Fang, Roman, Neo, Watts, it's just a hard sell to believe that he's the good guy. And they're reluctant to believe that the institution that they're part of, that they promise to protect people, and this whole system that has promised to protect people was actually created for evil. And we also have to remember that because this is a swap, Ozpin and Ruby had a lot of conversations. They had the leadership speech and another conversation at the dance, and those conversations would now be Salem and Ruby. So Ruby feels like on her end, she knows Salem. She knows their headmistress. She knows that the headmistress of Beacon really cares about them. She can't be evil. So Ozpin does something drastic. If the relic isn't enough, he hopes that showing them that the gods, in fact, did curse him with reincarnation will be. Knowing that he will return, Ozpin kills himself. Obviously, Ozpin does not reincarnate right away. Just the fact that he does it, because if he was lying, why? Like, he's either crazy or they have to be telling the truth. They have to be on to something. That and Ruby is still lingering on the relic saying that Summer was killed by Salem. So now there's a personal beef that maybe this is the cause that Summer fought and died for. Ozpin's cause. And despite everything that's happened, Ruby can feel in her heart that that at least is the truth. So from here on out, Team Ruby will be painted as enemies to the kingdoms, as enemies to peace and the world. Even though they're trying to avoid the destruction of Remnant, they have no proof of what Salem is doing for anyone else to see, and they can't exactly broadcast Jin to the world anyway. Even if they kept the CCT up, they can't broadcast Jin for everyone to see. All they have is Ozpin's word, yet they need to stop Salem from getting these relics and destroying the world. Now that we've laid the groundwork with volumes one to three, we're actually set up very nicely to complete the goals that I laid out at the beginning. This change going forward will allow Ruby to be more proactive. Now, instead of waiting around to defend the schools, they have to actually explore and travel around Remnant to have any hope of finding the relics, all while dodging trained huntsmen, malicious third parties who want the relics, and the Grimm that are still controlled by Salem. Salem has the knowledge of where all the relics are located, but now with the CCT down, she has to carefully give out this information. She can't make it too obvious to Ozpin where her operatives are going first, 
So there's wild goose chases. A lot of psychological, we're sending one team here as a distraction while the real team goes elsewhere. Just a lot of mind games with Salem at this point. And Salem mind games aside, on Team Ruby's end, it's still hard enough even without Salem. Which relic do they think Salem is most likely to go for first? And this will make everything very intense in a good way. Should they go for the Relic of Destruction so Salem can't have it? The Relic of Creation because of the unlimited possibilities it holds? The Crown of Choice to have a chance to see the future where she's defeated, potentially? Do they go for the Relic that's the closest to them, or the Relic that's further away but less guarded? For example, Vacua will be less guarded, but it's going to be harder to get to. Whereas they can sneak into Atlas, and Atlas is a smaller continent, but under Ironwood's scrutiny, it is going to be more difficult. So Vacuo has more freedom, but is harsher conditions, whereas Atlas is easier to get to, but is under military control. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of my other goals was to have Ruby get the hero's glory, and now there's really no one else to take it away. They are the underdogs. Everyone who would usually be fighting against Salem, like Ironwood, Winter, the Aesops, are actually helping Salem. Ospin has a much smaller faction because he's not in a position of power anymore, and this leaves the heroism to Team Ruby. Ruby being able to neutralize Salem's vaults instead of the maiden powers means that Ruby is always going to be the key to get a relic out of the vault if the relic has been captured by Salem's faction. However, I don't think that that's too overpowered since most of the relics are still out in the world. And to complete the God of Light's trial, that has no bearing, like that doesn't matter, the fact that Ruby has silver eyes. The deadly trials need to be completed using teamwork, which means all of Team Ruby will still have importance. The Maidens still exist as the Witches, but because they are also part Grim, they are susceptible to being stopped by Ruby and her teammates as well, so I think that this is a little bit more balanced. You still have something like the Maiden Powers, however, they have a major weakness, being part Grim. In terms of entertaining myself and hopefully keeping you guys interested, I find this really compelling because Ozpin is destructive, but with ultimately good intentions. He still works with the White Fang, gets Watts to hack Penny, and still hires Roman and Neo to do everything that they do in volumes one to three. So he's working with a lot of bad people. Salem gets perceived, on the other hand, as good by everyone, and people do not realize that they are being manipulated to help break her curse. And to me, this makes a lot of sense with volume six's backstory too. Like, I'm not gonna say it makes more sense. To me, it makes a lot of sense. Not more sense, but a lot of sense, because Ozpin loses everything. He retreats into the shadows. He's drunk in a bunch of his lives. Why doesn't Salem use that time to strike. Salem still wants to make her perfect kingdom, so she conquers lands and builds empires. There's a really big question of why now, and people see that as a plot hole. Why didn't Salem do anything up until now? And so this fixes that plot hole because this is what Salem has been doing the entire time, whereas Ozpin has had to go from nothing and try to build up a resistance. And now we have a narrative that Ruby is fighting against this oppressive system. They are the resistance and the stakes are higher because there is no one else if they fail. Something else fun about this rewrite is that Ozpin gets to work with seedy people. Ozpin can't work with licensed huntsmen for obvious reasons, so stealing dust and the infiltration and all of that sort of thing was outsourced to Neo and Roman. And that's why I included Trivia and Cinder's fake team and made it so Roman doesn't die. It's about the little switcheroo at the end there, is that Trivia is the odd one out in terms of she's actually Ozpin spy and she was planted into Cinder's team a long time ago for this specific purpose. Roman and Neo were never trying to kill Ruby because they know that the plan was for Ty and Crow to eventually bring them into the fold, but it was hard to manage her because she kept getting involved in their plans. And similar to working with Roman and Neo, Watts created the virus and Ozpin uses Watts's beef with Ironwood and Pietro, even though Watts is a shitty person who only cares about seeing Ironwood fall versus saving the world. It may be a good time to bring up that it's not about who were the heroes and the villains in the original story, but more like anyone who was recruited for the downfall of the schools has been transferred to Ozpin. So my reasoning for Watts is that Watts was spurned by Ironwood, who is part of Salem's faction. Ironwood has now switched on the board. He is now Team Salem. Therefore, Watts should be transferred to Ozpin's faction because it's not about in terms of the original show who was a villain and who was a hero character. It just has to do with the schools and the motivations of the villains staying intact. And so if Watts's motivation is still to take down Ironwood, guess what? Watts is on Team Ozpin now, not Team Salem. And with Cinder, Mercury, and Emerald, it was hard because Cinder has beef with the Huntsman system, if you want to call it that, with people in power and positions of authority because you have people like Rhodes that knew she was being abused and from her perspective didn't do anything, right? But the way that I see it is that 
Cinder was being recruited for the purpose of the witch's powers, that Salem promised power to her and being promised to never be powerless again. So in Cinder's case, she has less of an interest in being part of a resistance. And I think that Salem has more sway for that reason, because for Cinder, it's about being on top of the systems that already exist. And that includes the witch's system, the magic system, having the most magic that anyone can have. And so I think that that still applies. Hazel is on Ozpin's side and blames Salem for Gretchen's death since he found out that she made the schools and the huntsmen to be her weapons, not to protect people. And so I just imagine that after Gretchen died, Ozpin knocked on Hazel's door and was like, listen, let me tell you the truth. Hazel wouldn't switch sides, like he wouldn't go back to Team Salem eventually, but it is, th there is something to say about the fact that Ozpin is manipulating Hazel's grief. The White Fang would now firmly be a third party. They wanted to see the school destroyed and Ozpin wanted Beacon to be destroyed for his own ends. However, I think I would still make Adam an antagonist and I have a way of doing this specifically, which is that Salem intentionally leaks information about the relics to Adam. Because right now, the White Fang and Ozpin were working together and Adam feels betrayed that Sienna was working with Ozpin for this purpose. It never had anything to do with Beacon. It was just for another human cause, another grab for power that they destroyed the schools and communications, not as a message or a symbol or taking down the man or anything. I don't know. But they didn't do it for that purpose. They did it to screw over Salem in this hunt for the relics. Adam finding out about the relics and the fact that they exist tips him off to the fact that Ozpin had dishonest intentions and the White Fang kind of goes back into squarely being their own faction again and they want the relics and that's how they're in the story moving forward. Adam is like, we're not listening to any humans anymore. We're going to get the relics for ourselves and we're going to create a better world. But obviously, it being Adam, he gets kind of out of control and I could see him getting out of control with at least one relic if they got their hands on them. But I think that Cinder would make a truce with Adam instead of Raven in terms of replacing some volume five plot lines. After they leak the information to Adam, Cinder and Adam have this weird two-faced thing where they're both working together, but each one of them is planning to betray the other one. And I think that that would be interesting to see. And we need to talk about Lionheart because Lionheart is a double agent still because he's a coward and he'll side with everybody. Like he's just like, I want to be on the team that's winning. He would be a double agent for Ozpin, but still afraid of Salem, but still afraid of Ozpin. Like he would just be afraid. He's just afraid. So I think that in terms of Mistral, the vault at the Haven School would be compromised and Salem would know that they can't put a relic there. And that's actually why, again, she leaks this information to the White Fang and maybe even promises, we'll help you take down Mistral as well because she doesn't care anymore. She's like, I already know that Lionheart's not loyal to me. I cannot put a relic in the vault that's there because he's useless. And so she actually helps the White Fang destroy another school instead of Ozpin. I think that that would be kind of fucked up. In case it wasn't already clear, the relics aren't in a kingdom, but more spread between the continents, except for the dragon one. I think that Ozpin decided which relics went where after he found them all. Not that the relic of choice was specifically around Veil vale or something. So I have switched up the relic locations, obviously, because we start with the relic of knowledge and the relic of knowledge was en route to Veil. Vale. Salem is losing a lot of her villains, but she is gaining a lot of heroes. Lionheart aside, because he's just a whole mess, Ironwood and Theodore would still be on her side, which trickles down to characters like Penny, the Aesops, Winter, Rumple, Team Coffee, and Team Juniper. Penny's rebuilt, but has been poisoned against Ruby, her best friend, because Team Ruby are wanted fugitives. Salem still has Cinder, Mercury, Emerald. All of them are still loyal to her because she gave them a better life. Jean, Ren, and Nora think that Ruby actually killed Pyrrha. In terms of Raven, I have two minds of what to do with her. The first one is that she's hiding because of what Salem did to Summer, and she thinks it's hopeless to fight against the system, that Salem controls all the academies, she controls the governments, she's immortal, there is no hope. So even though Ozpin brought Crow and Tai Yang into the fold, after Raven found out that everything she had known was a lie, she was like, fuck this shit, I'm out, bye. The other alternative, though, is that Raven is one of the first witches. Now, I mentioned earlier that Salem had never bothered to make a witch before Cinder, before the rumors that the Relic of Knowledge made it out of its hiding place, and I do have a plan for that. If you guys are like, well, how did the Relic of Knowledge get out of there? How did they know? It's a secret, it's okay. But I was thinking that maybe Raven was some sort of 
prototype because we know that she can turn into a bird and originally those powers were given to her by Ozpin. But imagine in this case that she is made into the witch, but she also has the power to transform and maybe these things are more connected. And so the idea was for Raven to fly around Remnant and if she felt something to go after it, that she could cover distance more easily because she would be able to fly. And it still wouldn't be perfect, but Salem was experimenting and experimented on Raven. And so now Raven is in hiding. And so maybe that also gives an edge to Team Ruby because they can go to Raven. They can ask her to help. You know the land so well. You're already one of these witches. And, and first of all, Raven says no. Second of all, she can probably track me and knows exactly where I am at all times. If I get even close to that relic, she's going to know I am a coward. I'm staying home. And Yang calls her out on that. But eventually, maybe Raven would come around. And as I mentioned before, they won't have to sit around and protect the schools now. The attack on Beacon was an exception because they wanted to take down the CCT towers. And maybe Haven would get attacked because the White Fang wants to attack it. But I don't even know if Team Ruby would bother stopping the Academy from getting attacked. So I don't think that that actually matters now anymore. Now it would be about exploring the jungles and mountains of Mistral, the desert temples of Vacuo, the snowy tundras and underground caves in Atlas. There would be a lot more of a focus on exploration, on strategy, on fighting their way through the world. And the character arcs could easily still stay intact and even be enhanced by this change. Ruby has all this pressure since she's the only known silver-eyed warrior alive, and if Salem captures any of the relics they need her, she's the only way to get them out of those grim vaults. Yang loses an arm partially because of Ozpin's faction, and she's forced to work with them anyway. Watts of all people is the one that's gonna give Yang a new arm, and she just doesn't know how to feel about all of this. Blake is dealing with the guilt over Adam going after Yang, and then also knowing that both sides have been using the Faunus the whole time. Ozpin has been using the White Fang, but Salem has as well. Weiss has to deal with whether or not this is the right way to uphold the Schnee legacy and become this fugitive outcast that goes against her sister and the general. Because she wouldn't be sad that she's going against Jacques, right? That was the entire point of her becoming a huntress, was going against Jacques. But now she's also disappointed Winter, and Winter is the one that helped her get out, that helped her be able to learn how to use her semblance properly. And so now she's in this situation where she's diametrically opposed to Winter. So in that sense, Mistral's arc would still revolve around Raven's bandits, the White Fang, Ilya and Adam. You have Cinder, Emerald, and Mercury being two-faced with the White Fang. You have Team Juniper, or what's left of Juniper, trying to hunt Team Ruby down because they killed Pyrrha. Everyone is trying to get the relic. I guess Nora would be the witch now if we're not doing men. <laughs> if we're not doing the men. I mean, I guess there's no, there's no technical reason. I guess in this case, because we're keeping the witches to be women, it would be Nora. But I also think something kind of fucks about John turning himself into a monster to continue what Pyrrha was fighting for. John is continuing Pyrrha's legacy by making himself into this monster and that he made this sacrifice to try to continue what he thought was the right thing to do and it wasn't. But that works with Nora as well. To talk more about where the relics are for a second, I did mention this a couple times, but I want them to be in this weird space that's almost like the Ever After. Not connected to the Ever After, but we don't really know where the gods hid them. Osmond is just like, yeah, I found one one day and then I asked it the question so I could find all the other ones. So I want a crazy, you enter into this temple and it's this dungeon and everything is insane and dangerous, sort of like a video game domain or like a palace from Persona or something like Madoka Magica or Little Goody Two Shoes. Like you're entering this domain and there's puzzles and there's danger and possibly even Grimm or something the God of Light created in order to stop people that aren't Ozpin from finding all the relics. So moving on from the Mistral arc, by the time they reach Atlas, I think that Ironwood already has the Relic of Creation locked up in the vault and that Winter took the place of Weiss in terms of the witch, right? Because Weiss originally was going to be Salem's choice and so she decided to change it to be Winter. And this would be more of a heist compared to the Mistral arc where Team Ruby can't operate as openly as they could outside the kingdom of Mistral. There's this tension between Ruby wanting Penny to naturally see their side as her friend, but Penny ultimately being controlled by Ironwood, and then Penny being hacked by Watts. Ruby has to grapple with the fact that Watts and Ironwood are both taking away Penny's free will, just so Penny can help them get closer to the vault. So that would be a plot point. Ruby feeling guilty about that and knowing that both sides are taking away Penny's agency. Weiss has to go against Winter and face the fact that Salem made Winter into a monster in her stead, so she feels guilty, I think, for leaving. Ozpin's faction sides 
with Robin and Neo and Roman even help Robin to steal, like steal the supplies that they're stealing in Volume 7 to prevent the global communications from going up. And Robin, though, would go ballistic, I think, when she finds out you didn't actually care about the people of Mantle. You just wanted to stop communications from going back up. You just wanted to fuck over Ironwood and wanted to stop him from using the resources to build up Amity. You didn't actually care about us. You just used us. You just used us as a cover story. And yeah, I guess you stole for us, but it wasn't because you actually cared about what's going on with us. You just did it to get this relic. And so I feel like there would be all this struggle with Team Ruby genuinely wanting to do the right thing most of the time, but always being caught up in Ozpin doing wrong and that they kind of have no choice but to steal airships and fuck people over every once in a while because they can't tell people the truth and they don't have any proof as to what the truth is. And if we're trying to keep Volume 9 mostly intact, I feel like that Neo wanting to kill Ruby notwithstanding, because obviously that wouldn't happen, unless Roman dies and Neo blames Ruby again. All of that aside, no wonder Ruby would finally crack. She doesn't know who she is anymore. She doesn't want the burden of being the only Silver Eyed Warrior. And Ruby's mental breakdown, I think, would again, not necessarily make more sense, but simply be enhanced by this change because the pressure is on ever since the end of Volume 3. Like, you are our only hope. If Salem takes this relic, you are the only one that can get it out of the vault. And we would have this nice contrast because they don't need to worry about that in the Mistral uh, relic finding because the Mistral relic is still out into the world and so there's less pressure but they get to Atlas and the relic's locked up. That's where the pressure really starts to mount and so we have this nice contrast between Ruby and her friends exploring the world and fighting against all odds and getting the relic that's supposed to be around the kingdom of Mistral and then they get to Atlas and it's like you're up Ruby this is all you. We have to do anything we can to get you in particular into that vault and then you have this idea of oh what if Ruby uses her silver eyes and kills Winter exactly like how she killed Pyrrha and there's guilt and PTSD and just one more thing, as I previously mentioned, I think this works just as well with Salem and Ozpin's Volume 6 backstory, but there's one more thing specifically from the fairy tale book, and that's what I wanted to bring up. But Salem wanted to rule. Why would she give up trying? I don't understand. Ozpin gave up for so many lives in a row, so why didn't Salem use that opportunity to strike? And I talked about that, people seeing that as a plot hole. And it's not that necessarily that this is better, but I think it does cover up the hole a little bit because it explains the lost time in a way that's easier to believe because Salem did not just sit around. She spent her time building up the kingdoms and the armies and the academies, not just recruiting three people to her faction every year like talk and whisking them away to a castle in the middle of nowhere. She has been making moves. And so it's more believable, at least to me, that, oh, this is what she was doing all this time. And the reason why Ozpin has been slow to fight back is because he is not the one in the position of power anymore. She is, whereas in the show, Ozpin is in the position position of power and you wonder why Ozpin gave up for so long and then suddenly Ozpin makes a comeback and Salem didn't do anything during that time. But now we have this idea that Ozpin has been trying to build a resistance and it keeps failing. And this particular change is canon compliant in terms of the fairy tale book because in the fairy tale book, there is an entire story of Ozpin teaching people how to unlock their auras, their semblances, how to defend themselves against the Grimm and he tries to build the circle. This is an order or a faction that follows him. He doesn't try to build it. Like, he accidentally saves a village and then the people kind of build it around him, but still, he eventually gives in and decides to be their leader. And then, Salem kills them all. She sends somebody to slaughter all of them that's heavily implied in the fairy tale book. And Ozpin actually fights against Salem's operative and dies, like intentionally loses and dies because he knows that he'll reincarnate. And in the space of that time, Salem's operatives killed all those people and they lost faith in him. And the one person that remembers, remembers him as a failure, somebody who just let their people be slaughtered. Because from Ozpin's perspective, in the fairy tale book, the conditions were, if I I lose fighting you. Will you leave my people alone? And they're like, sure. And he just believes it for some reason. And so he dies purposefully and loses the fight. And then he expects to go back and find all his people still there because that was the promise. I don't know why he believed that, but then all his people are slaughtered. So it makes sense in the fairy tale. Like they talk about this in the fairy tale book that Ozpin builds up resistances and it failed. And obviously in the canon of the show, it's that he failed a couple times and then he finally succeeded probably as the king of 
fail. But in our story, we see the history of him trying and failing over a bunch of different periods. And so the idea of why hasn't Salem won yet, which has been criticized a lot, is mitigated, I feel like, by this change. It's more believable. Why? She's just putting the finishing touches right now. She's made her academy. She made her fortresses. She spent 80 years after the Great War making these kingdoms, these fortresses, so she can fortify her relic because she knows Ozpin is not as willing to let innocent people die. So she has spent all this spare time coming into power. When we get into the picture, when Team Ruby gets into the picture, she's almost done. She's almost won. She has the relic of knowledge. She knows all of the locations. She's basically finished. She's at the finish line. Whereas in the show, it's weird because it's like, well, why didn't she do anything? What has she been doing? And on Ozpin's end, it makes sense that he hasn't been able to succeed for this long because he's still licking his wounds. Every time he tries to strike against Salem, she just gets stronger. She has more people gathered around her that love her and adore her because she protects them against the Grimm and the threat that she also, she creates the threat to protect them from. That being said, what do you guys think? Would you want a full rewrite version of this where I go through things in even more detail? Like I'm talking episode by episode. This is an overview. This is how would things be adjusted to where Ruby ended now? But what I'm thinking of is if you guys are interested, what I can actually do is this is rewriting all the scripts in volume one and maybe even rewriting stuff past volume nine. Fanfic AU scenario where everything gets rewritten. And instead of this, where I just explain what happens, I actually read a script, you know, kind of like Ruby Evermorrow. If you guys have seen Kale's project and other things like that, like a little voice acting, a little pictures, a little episode by episode. So if that's something that interests you, let me know, you guys. I think this rewrite has a lot of potential. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for attending Klaxon's Royal Court today, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.